Coming up on today's episode of Airborne, Airbus A350-900 sets a first for EASA certification. The first TBM-700 with G600 GTN-750 avionics rolls out the door. And EAA announces the winners of the Fairchild 24 giveaway. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The European Aviation Safety Agency has issued the type certificate of the Airbus A350-900. This certification is the first Airbus passenger aircraft with a new design to be entirely certified by EASA. From the application by Airbus in 2007 until the type certification. During the certification program, EASA has established 16 technical panels composed of 40 engineers and test pilots, covering the full range of the program from structure to avionics and from cabin safety to test flights. EASA's flight test teams have actively participated in more than 250 hours of flight testing. The Airbus A350-900 can carry 315 passengers over a distance of 7,750 nautical miles. Its in-service safety record will now be monitored by Airbus and EASA through continued airworthiness activities. Dara Sakata has delivered the first avionics modernized TBM-700 turboprop aircraft with a Garmin G600 GTN-750 new generation glass cockpit avionics retrofit, replacing mechanical equipment and first generation CTR electronic flight displays. The company says the installation is a lower cost alternative to a full retrofit with the Garmin G1000 integrated flight instrument system. This upgrade's cost, including replacement of the instrument panel, begins at $120,000 for a dual screen G600 basic package with an installation time estimated at 250 man hours. The Garmin G600 upgrade pairs a liquid crystal primary flight display and multifunction display in a single 10 inch bezel. Capabilities of its sophisticated graphics include synthetic vision technology, providing a virtual reality perspective view along the aircraft's flight path. After these messages, we'll find out who the proud owner is of the EAA Fairchild 24H Classic Airplane. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing and crosswinds. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird X-Wind SE and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulation.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to support Airborne Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop an email to jim at aero-news.net. Who could forget the beautifully restored Fairchild 24H Deluxe that sat for the week of Air Venture near the tower, and the lines of people signing small slips of paper with hopes of winning the airplane as part of EAA's annual aircraft sweepstakes? Well, if you're wondering who won the plane, Wonder no more. It's reported by the EAA that Marsha Fulton of Covington, Indiana is the proud new owner of the vintage 1937 Fairchild. On Monday, September 29th, EAA staff called Marsha and John Fulton to inform them of the exciting news. John said, quote, we're just thrilled. I've never missed an Oshkosh convention and she always puts $100 into both the aircraft sweepstakes and the Young Eagle raffle. This year, we got lucky, end quote. John is a longtime EAA member, and the Fultons actually have a collection of airplanes that will now have a new hangar mate. He's been attending the EAA annual convention since 1964. Marsha said, quote, We just love EAA. It's a great organization with lots of wonderful people, end quote. It's Friday at last, and time for our weekly barnstorming commentary. For a few months now, we've been giving you some hints about big changes coming to our airborne program. Now Jim is ready to let some of the cat out of the bag. Here's this week's barnstorm. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. 
Well, we've been hinting an awful lot that there are big changes in the works for not just Airborne, but Aero News and Aero TV. And to be perfectly honest, we're not going to tell you everything that we're working on right now, but we're going to give you a pretty broad hint of what we're trying to accomplish. First of all, let's talk a little bit about what we've done. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, Aero News was conceived to be the first real-time 24-7, uh, 365 aviation news service. And boy, we did it. Uh, that was some 200,000 stories ago, uh, seven some odd thousand podcasts, 4,000 plus Aero TV pieces, uh, four or 500 Airborne. There's just so many things that have been accomplished in this uh, nearly two decades of Aero News. But we really believe that our best work is not only ahead of us, but just around the corner. We have big changes for Airborne, Airborne being a flagship product of Aero News and Aero TV. Uh, to make a long story short, we're going to be going five days a week the first week of January or so, depending on some scheduling issues, probably around the 5th. That'll be a Monday. Uh, that means Monday through Friday you'll be able to see Airborne each day. Now, normally that would be big news, but the fact of the matter is that is not the big news. The big news is what we're going to be doing with Airborne. It has long been our opinion that aviation is too fragmented, uh, that everybody is preaching to their own choir and no place else, that there is no crossover, that the best leadership in aviation is rarely heard from simply because they're not the big 600-pound gorilla associations like AOPA and the mix. But at the same time, there are tremendous voices out there doing great work that need to be heard from. Their constituencies need to be more important in the total universe of aviation, that we need to be speaking with a united voice, not just amongst ourselves, but to the world outside, and to craft a tool by which aviation can get its news, information, concerns, and most important, its mission in front of more people, not just us, but the rest of the world. We've got some ideas about that. We've been talking to a lot of people, uh, some really smart people, some folks who have really done a tremendous amount of work within aviation and are some, some of the most innovative folks we know. And they agree we're on to something. Uh, without exception, on all the folks we've consulted, and that's been a couple hundred by now, they think that what we're going to be doing next has the potential to really provide an extraordinary tool to aviation. And so that's what we're going to be doing. But we need your help and support. We're going to be hiring. We need additional hosts to help Ashley do what she's been doing so well for the last three years. We need additional videographers and writers. If you're in that business, if you know aviation, if you have those talents, send us a resume. Jim, J-I-M at A-E-R-O dash N-E-W-S dot N-E-T. And as the information about our future mission becomes more public and more available, we hope you'll let us know what you think we need to do to properly focus it, to build a better mission profile, to be of more importance to the entire aviation and aerospace communities, and to be more involved in spreading the word about what we're trying to do, how we're trying to do it, and be involved in that process. We've got a lot on our plate. It's the biggest mission we've ever undertaken since we started this whole thing. 20 years ago, or nearly 20 years ago, we changed the aviation media business. We're about to do it again. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell. And yeah, we got some really cool things up our sleeves. Avidine Corporation has extended their repair service agreement with Duncan Aviation of Lincoln, Nebraska to include Avidine's EX500 series of multifunction displays. Duncan Aviation will now be the exclusive provider of repair services for Avidine customers that are using the EX500 as well as its first-generation flight situation displays and early model Flight Max multifunction displays. Under the terms of the agreement, Duncan Aviation will be the worldwide repair center for Avidyne's EX500 series of MFDs. Since 2010, Duncan Aviation has provided similar repair and support services for Avidyne's legacy display products, including the 5RR FSD and the Flight Max line of MFDs. Repair and services of Avidyne's EX500 MFBs will be fully transitioned to Duncan Aviation's Lincoln facility within the next 30 to 60 days, with no customer delays expected. After the break, we'll see that the Sierra Nevada Corporation is moving ahead despite their problems with the NASA contract. ADS-B will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States, but you can benefit from ADS-B today with the Bendix King KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADS-B out 
when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Finally, the extraordinary story of the world-changing XPRIZE space competition is being told and illustrated with hundreds of insider photos in Jim Campbell's colorful new book, Beyond the Blue. Journey with Jim as he flies formation with spaceships, plays in zero gravity, prepares rocket racers, and documents the amazing first decade of the personal space race. Available this summer. Get your advance order in now by checking out www.kindredspirit.com. Welcome back. Sierra Nevada Corporation has announced a design for an integrated system for human spaceflight that can be launched to low Earth orbit using strato launch systems air launch capabilities in a scale version of SNC's Dream Chaser spacecraft. The Dream Chaser is a reusable lifting body spacecraft capable of crewed or autonomous flight, and it's the only lifting body spacecraft capable of a runway landing anywhere in the world. Strato Launch Systems is a Paul G. Allen project developing an air launch system consisting of a massive winged six-engine aircraft capable of lifting spacecraft into the stratosphere for launching. The Dream Chaser Strato Launcher Human Space Flight System can carry a crew of three astronauts to low Earth orbit destinations. This system can also fly uncrewed space missions. The Scaled Crew spacecraft design is based on SNC's full-scale Dream Chaser vehicle. Cessna says the Citation Latitude flight test program has yielded improvements in expected aircraft range and runway performance, and that's good news for any test program. The aircraft specification is being changed to reflect a projected increase in range to 2,700 nautical miles. Additionally, runway performance is expected to be improved with a takeoff distance now of 3,668 feet. Cessna has also introduced a fourth aircraft into the Latitude Certification Program. The Latitude Certification Flight Test Program has amassed more than 600 flight hours and more than 260 flights. The first fully configured Citation Latitude will make its public debut at the 2014 National Business Aviation Association's annual meeting in Orlando, Florida, from October the 21st through the 23rd. Certification of the Citation Latitude is expected in the second quarter of 2015. Well, that's our program for October 3rd. Remember to get comprehensive real-time 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Remember, Airborne is streamed three times a week and is always online, and you can join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new episode. And remember that the next generation of Airborne will be unveiled right after New Year's. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.